in the wake of what happened Wednesday in D.C., I've seen a lot of comments, you know, basically portraying Trump as some sort of crazy guy. Now, a lot of this comes from the left, and that's to be expected. They've been doing that for the last four years. It's nothing new. But I've also seen it from even some of my people I know on social media who are Trump supporters, Republicans, conservatives, who think he's just gone too far. He's out of his mind. He's doing damage to the Republican Party, his own legacy, you know, the, the future, whatever. And I think I can see how people could think that. There's a part of my brain which thinks the same thing, like, oh my God, this, this didn't help. And it didn't. Don't get me wrong. This did not help. But reading these things, something popped into my mind. And it was something I read in 1989. 1989 was the bicentennial of the French Revolution. And it was a big deal in France, as one might assume. And I was reading an article that involved interviews with some of the leading French and other non-French historians of the revolution. And I can't remember which of the historians was being interviewed in this particular section of this article. But he was asked, what do you think is the legacy of the French Revolution? And his response, 200 years after the French Revolution was, it's too soon to tell. And I thought, you know, that's really profound. You know, I really had to sit back and think, yeah, we really don't know the impact of these things often until much later. You know, at the time, you know, for example, take the printing press. I mean, how long, how many centuries passed before we fully understood the impact, the effect of a development of the printing press? You know, we're still coming to grips to some extent with that today, you know, almost uh, half a millennia later. And then I thought to Trump, his candidacy, his presidency, and how this has all ended. And the thought hit me. Is it too soon to tell? Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. We all know what happened after Hitler came to power in Germany. On the 30th of January, 1933, the president, Paul von Hindenburg, named Hitler chancellor and asked him to form a government. Now, at that time, the Nazis did not were not the biggest, they were the biggest party in the Reichstag, the parliament, but they were by no means a majority. But he didn't know what else to do. Now, if you go back a year to 1932, there had been a presidential election. He had won that election. He won in a runoff, 53% of the vote. The communists, who at that point weren't pursuing uh, popular front, common front politics, opposed him and, of course, the Nazis. And they got about 10% of the vote. Thalman ran, Ernst Thalman, 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 Thalman. I forget exactly how it's pronounced. He got 10%. So collectively, Hindenburg and the communists and the bloc that supported Hindenburg got almost two-thirds of the vote, about 60, 63%. The Nazis got the rest, about 36%, a little more than a third of the vote. That's it. Now, that's the situ situation that Hindenburg was in as he's considering what to do as you know, governments keep collapsing because none of them have a majority. And what he is persuaded to do by some of his less astute advisors is to bring in Hitler and the Nazis. Let them form a government, since they're the biggest party. And because this guy's such an idiot, they can probably control him and contain him and, you know, bury him in paperwork or something. It's not clear exactly what they thought they were going to do or how they were going to contain him, but they never thought that what was going to happen over the next 12 years was going to happen. Did Hindenburg have any other options? He did. Instead of 
I mean, the guy wasn't committed to the Weimar Republic. He wasn't committed to the Weimar Constitution. He considered himself a German nationalist. He probably was secretly a monarchist, a royalist, like to bring the Kaiser back. He could have, as president, used decrees, which Hitler later used when he became president after Hindenburg died. And with the support of the army, which would have, the army would have supported Hindenburg in a second. He's a former field marshal, the hero of Tannenberg, commander in chief during the war. They would have backed him. They didn't like Hitler. They didn't like the communists for sure. Hindenburg could have just declared martial law, taken over, gotten rid of the Reichstag for a while, and tried to restructure the German political system. Because the Weimar Republic, the bottom line was the Weimar Republic wasn't working. It wasn't functioning. It was a nice idea. It was democratic. It was open. But it didn't work. That was the problem. It kept falling. Things kept falling apart. Nobody could get a majority. There were too many different little parties and nobody could get a working majority and they couldn't come together and there was all this infighting. Like I said, if the communists had ever worked with the Social Democrats, collectively, they could have shut down the Nazis. But they didn't do that. It was the common turn and Stalin was telling them, these are all fascists. Hitler's a fascist. The Social Democrats are fascist. The Catholic Center Party's a fascist. Don't work with any of them. Stand aloof. Our goal isn't to make Germany work. Our goal, from Stalin's point of view, is to make Germany fail so that the communists can take over. But Hindenburg had an option. What if he had done that? What if Paul von Hindenburg, former field marshal, had declared martial law, ruled by decree, and then tried to restructure the German Republic, rewrite a new constitution, find something that was more functional than what they had? At the time, he would have been attacked not just by the German press, he would have been attacked by the American press. He would have been attacked by the Times of London. He would have been attacked by the New York Times. He's undemocratic. He's suppressing the will of the people. He shut down parliament. He's ruling by martial law. He's using the army. There's a bit of military coup in Germany. German militarism is on the march. We're headed for another war. This is going to be the end. It's all going to be over. That's what they would have said. But if we look back at it from perspective of 2021, or even from perspective of 1946, you can only wish that Hindenburg had just said, no way, there's no way I'm going to put this idiot former corporal in charge of Germany. I'm not going to do that. I don't want that to be my legacy, which is basically what it was. To the extent anybody remembers Paul von Hindenburg, he's the guy who named Hitler chancellor. That's his legacy, at least his political legacy. If you're a military historian, you know the things he did with regard to uh, the Great War. But that became his legacy. He's the guy who turned over the hospital to one of the leading inmates, Adolf Hitler, and his party of mental patients. He's the guy who did that. That's how we view it today in retrospect. I mean, you can only sit here and wish he had done something else. Anything, you know, martial law, military takeover in Germany would have been far better than what we got and what happened, not just to Germany itself, but to the rest of the world. You know, not just the Holocaust, I mean, 24 million dead Russians, destruction all over Europe, tens of millions of people died. But it's only in retrospect that we see the opportunity that Hindenburg failed to grasp, an action that would have been condemned at the moment, but would have been would have saved the world from all kinds of destruction. Of course, no one would ever know that because they wouldn't know, nobody could foresee exactly what was going to come to Europe and to Germany with Hitler in power. Unless, of course, they read Mein Kampf, which most people never read. Now, what's my point? What's this have to do with Trump and what's happened 
you know, what happened Wednesday in D.C. What I'm saying, and don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing, I wish Trump had declared martial law and, you know, taken over the government, crossed a Rubicon, established himself as you know, dictator. Uh, I don't think he should have done that. It would have been a disaster. I don't think he could have done that. I don't think he would have gotten sufficient political support among the GOP or certainly among the military hierarchy to do that. So that really wasn't an option. My point, though, is it's too early to judge Trump's actions since November 3rd. We just don't know. A lot's going to depend on what happens over the next 10 years. What's the situation in this country 10 years from now? Because that will decide how we view Trump's final days. If the United States' is a vision of racial harmony, the economy's doing well, COVID's been tackled, the industrial sector is booming, manufacturing is sustained, we're working out good deals with China, people are happy, maybe they've got free health care, free education, student loans have been dismissed. Taxes are up, but not that badly up, not that high. People will go back and say, my God, you know, what was Trump thinking? What a lunatic. The guy was a moron. He lost the election. What a crybaby. You go home. But what if Trump fears comes true? And he's not the only one who fears these things. And keep in mind about Trump. When he said they spied on his campaign, they did. You know, when he said Stockholm, uh, Sweden had problems and everybody poo pooed it and said, oh. <laughs> they did. When he said the same thing about Belgium and he was attacked, they had problems in Belgium. Next thing you know, we got like on schedule terror attacks. You know, Trump has a habit of saying things that look very weird, but turn out to be true. What if 10 years from now, the economy is in the pits? What if, you know, Biden and company have done, you know, are in the process of doing away with a fossil fuel industry and the electric industry just isn't keeping up? There aren't enough places to charge your electric car. You have mass unemployment, double digit inflation. You got a misery index in double digits like we did under the Carter administration. We're getting, you know, screwed around with the world by the Chinese. We've been made fools of by the Iranians. And, you know, Biden gets caught sending pallets of cash to Tehran. All these things could really happen. We have flood of immigrants coming in that are driving wages back down. We bring in all these refugees from the Middle East, and suddenly we're getting an increase in the number of uh, terrorist attacks, jihadist attacks. Crime rates still going up, murders in the cities, the police are being defunded. This is a cycle of violence and lawlessness throughout the country. What if all that happens? What if we're like on the road to becoming Venezuela in 10 years? How will people look back at Trump from November until January from that perspective if things are bad? <laughs> there might be people like, oh my God, I wish Trump had done something more to prevent this from happening. You know, the Supreme Courts, you know, they add four new justices, they add new states. Whatever they did in uh, the uh, 2020 election is just repeated in other elections. There's ballot harvesting. Everybody gets a ballot in the mail. They, they find ways to force states from stop doing uh, you know, voter ID, the, our election system becomes a joke. What if this happens? And that's my point. It's too soon to judge Trump. If Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the Democrats do a good job of running the country over the next decade, Donald Trump will look like a buffoon. Basically, I'm talking about this, his final days from November 3rd 
you know, until his, what is January 20th. That's how Trump will look, like an idiot. But if, God forbid, the things Trump is worried about with the Democratic session of control of all the levers of government, the executive, the Senate, the legislative branch, and probably soon, once they pack the court, the judicial branch, what happens if what he fears, and what many other people fear, myself included, turns out to be true? How will we view Trump in 2031, 2032? If we're due to have an election in yeah, 2032, and it, it, we know he's going to win because Republicans never win anymore, how will we look back at these recent events. And that's what I'm saying is it's, it's too soon to tell. You know, it's, it's, if it's too soon to tell about the French Revolution 200 years after the event, it's too soon to tell about Donald Trump's behavior since election day in early 2021. We can have opinions, but you can't say, especially as a historian, I can't say this is it any more than I could have said, you know, with metaphysical certainty that, you know, Hindenburg's decision not to declare martial law, but to give power to Adolf Hitler was a good move. After all, Hindenburg saved the Weimar Constitution. He saved the Weimar Republic. That's my opinion. Let me know what yours is in a comment. Uh, try to be constructive. You know, just calling me a, a white ass doesn't doesn't really uh, doesn't really advance the discussion. Uh, pasty white ass or something like that, whatever it was. I love I like actually I like comments like that. Unfortunately, they tend to get taken down by YouTube I, for for reasons, and I don't even by the time I see them in my email announcements and I go to respond to them, they're gone. Uh, taken down not by me but by by YouTube apparently. Uh, but anyway, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Uh, leave a constructively negative comment. That's fine. I don't mind at all. I try to read them all. Um, you know, share the video with your friends if you care to. and Subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. And until the next time, keep fighting.